Well, good afternoon. My name is Jim Grotran. I have the pleasure of serving as the Executive Vice President of Strong Community College. It's also my pleasure to be presenting to you um, for the second time um, in a series last year, um, the Sustainable Leadership Presentation hosted here at Metropolitan Community College. The presentation today is titled Renewable and Clean Fuel Technologies, the Future of Transportation Today. Metropolitan Community College cares about Omaha's air quality, the emissions of our fleet vehicles, and the energy and fuel we consume during our day-to-day -day business at our campuses um, spread across our four county region. We're here to learn and listen, as you are, to solutions for our institutions as well as how these important technologies will transform transportation in the future. We will hear from three regional experts and our own Chris Swanson with Metro Community College about technologies to fuel and power vehicles, including biofuels and electric vehicles themselves. MCC is proud to partner with Central Community College, Wage Cap, Nebraska, and Jocelyn Institute for, for Sustainable Communities to produce this series for our students and the community. Say hello to Central Community College's faculty, staff, etc. at their various campuses and centers in Hastings, Grand Island, Columbus, and Kearney. Hello to all of you out there. There will be time for questions and answers following the presentation, and you can even tweet your questions using the hashtag SLPS Thursday, all one word. Well, thank you very much. I look forward to the presentation this afternoon, and once again, it is a pleasure to be hosting this from Metropolitan Community College of Omaha campus. Next, I'd like to introduce Chris Monson. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Yes, thank you, Jim. We really appreciate you kicking us off uh, this year and uh, really all your contributions to the sustainability efforts here at the college. It goes a long way, so thank you. Good afternoon uh, to all those watching us live here in person at Fort Omaha, and uh, welcome to all those joining us streaming online. I think we're in for a real treat today. I think we have an excellent panel of experts, regional experts, uh, across many technologies. Uh, today we are going to be talking about the future of transportation. I will be your moderator, Chris Swanson. I am the program coordinator for the Alternative Fuels Program here at MCC. My role at the college is uh, as a grants coordinator to build a curriculum and training program around uh, alternative fuels. Since we as Omahans are in the center of the country, we are fortunate enough to be a transportation hub. Talking with our industry partners, we know that um, two major job growth areas are in CDL truck driving, uh, as well as those mechanics that fix those trucks. So when we were received the Alternative Fuels Grant, we decided to focus first and foremost on compressed natural gas within heavy-duty fleet vehicles. From a uh, sustainability standpoint, we are in the process of converting our existing CDL fleet over to CNG so that we can not only reduce our carbon footprint, but so we can also have our fuel costs in those training areas, therefore keeping um, the college affordable for, for future students. To date, we've trained over 170 participants uh, in CNG, including safety courses, uh, maintenance and inspection courses uh, for our automotive technicians as well as our diesel technicians. And we've also done some uh, safety training with compressed natural gas for our first responder students. See if this works. Well, I will uh, not have any more slides to show you, I think, unless, can you want to advance? Well, there we go, perfect. Uh, there's a couple examples of the uh, vehicles that we use here at Metro to train our students. Um, from a sustainability standpoint, uh, the college has also purchased a small fleet of lighter duty CNG vehicles. Uh, to date, we have, uh, I think, four police vehicles that are CNG equipped. We also have a facilities cargo van and a pickup truck used in the applied technology area. We are committed to compressed natural gas uh, training 
in this area, as we know, it will lead to jobs for our students. Our next focus with the remaining grant dollars is to expand our alternative fuel arsenal to include new technologies like biodiesel fuel, hybrid vehicles, and electric vehicles as well. Uh, there is an idea that we're currently kicking around where we will take the vegetable oil from our culinary students, process it, and use it for fuel in our CDL training program uh, so we can tighten that sustainability loop from, for our various training programs. The waste of one can become the input for another, uh, further reducing fuel costs for those programs. Our hope is also to usher in an electric vehicle infrastructure at MCC, uh, an infrastructure that is capable of supporting a commuter fleet for all those administrators, staff, and faculty members that uh, travel frequently between all the campuses, uh, and also have that infrastructure capable of supporting a few grounds uh, maintenance vehicles to work around the uh, various campuses we have. Uh, ideally, this electric vehicle infrastructure would tie into our existing solar facilities uh, at the Fort Omaha campus and the South Omaha campus. That way we can harness the, power, the sun's power, uh, have absolutely zero fuel cost, and uh, a net zero impact on the environment. So those are what we're trying to do over the next 12 months with the remaining grant dollars. Uh, the Alternative Fuels Grant has reinforced MCC's commitment to reducing our carbon footprint. As, as Jim mentioned, we are committed to uh, improving our air quality. Uh, we're also uh, strengthening our promise to provide high quality training for our students um, entering the next wave of the green economy. So as a college, our future is incredibly bright. Um, but as a community, I think it's, it's even brighter. And today we have gathered three experts uh, Jim Stark of Green Plains Renewable Energy will discuss corn ethanol. We'll follow Jim with Scott Williams of the Omaha Biofuels Co-op, who will be talking about other biofuels, including algae. And we will wrap up with Bill Moore of EV World, um, who will enlighten us on the future of electric vehicles. Uh, each will have 15 minutes to present um, on their transportation technology. And I will keep a rather tight leash so that we can have uh, a pretty robust 30-minute Q&A session with the audience. I request that uh, if you do have a question, uh, please uh, use our hashtag SLPSThursday, uh, or for those with a WebEx connection, just type into the chat room, and we will make sure that all your questions are addressed uh, after the presentation. So um, let's bring out the real experts, uh, Jim Stark with Green Plains Renewable Energy. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Thank you. How's everyone today? That's good. Um, just a little bit about me. I am uh, Vice President of Investor Media Relations. And you may wonder what a uh, person that does most of the communications would be doing here. Fortunately for me, I get the luxury of telling the story of our company, and more so our industry every day, in, day in and day out. So I hope to share my knowledge that I've gained over the last six years about the value of corn ethanol, what it has meant to not only the, to our country, but also to uh, the Midwest uh, community. Uh, Green Plains, just a quick overview. We are a Fortune 1000 diversified commodity processing business. Uh, we have slightly over $3 billion of revenues. We are publicly traded on the NASDAQ. We uh, also have about 140 employees here at our corporate office here in Omaha. We have another 200 uh, employees in Nebraska on top of that, and another 500 employees in, in the 10 states that you see uh, most of these uh, locations listed today. When we uh, think about uh, our operations, we have about a billion gallons of, of ethanol capacity that requires about 350 million bushels of corn, or about 10 million tons of corn that we process annually. Along with that is, uh, as a co-product of the production process, uh, we can produce or do produce 3 million tons of livestock feed. That is the protein and fiber that's left over after we've taken that corn kernel and extracted the starch out of that corn kernel. We also have added additional technologies over the last couple of years. We extract corn oil out of uh, the kernel as well. That corn oil is an industrial grade corn oil. Uh, it actually gets sold to a lot of biodiesel plants. Uh, for their feedstock to make, uh, make their fuel. We also sell it to a lot of livestock producers who will use it as a feed additive as well. 
We also uh, do marketing and distribution uh, for our products around the U.S. in export. Next slide. Um, I'm going to kind of start in the middle here with corn ethanol and talk more so about what it, its importance means to uh, the U.S. economy, again, and the regional economy. Uh, when you think about corn ethanol, it was written into law as part of the Energy Information Security Act of 2007. Uh, the primary goal then, and some may not remember, is we were short uh, gasoline. We were being controlled by uh, countries that don't like the U.S. very much. So as it was written into law, the goal was to reach 15 billion gallons of corn ethanol by 2015. We are today producing somewhere around uh, 13 and a half. Actually, the industry is producing closer to 14.2 uh, billion gallons on an annualized run rate, which about 13.6 billion of those gallons are being consumed domestically in the U.S. fuel supply. Uh, the rest of those gallons are being exported. Uh, we have uh, a number of countries who have engaged in renewable fuel standards in their, in their locations. They do this because they understand the value uh, of what ethanol brings to the fuel mix. So when we think about it, uh, this year alone, there will be 450 million barrels less of crude oil that will get, ex get imported from uh, the Middle East and South America into the U.S. this year. Uh, ethanol has been a very important job growth opportunity for the Midwest. It supports somewhere around 400,000 direct and indirect jobs in the Corn Belt where these plants are located. Uh, when you think about it, ethanol today is the single largest demand source of, for corn. What, what we're trying to get across there, if you think about how much corn we actually consume, uh, we are uh, well ahead of anything that's ever been exported, particularly to any country. And just to make sure everyone understands, the corn that we use is not human-grade corn. It is a feed-grade corn that's fed to livestock. So we're not taking corn away from, uh, from anyone that, from, a, from a human consumption standpoint. Uh, just one other quick thing to touch on is, Back in 2007, when the Renewable Fuel Standard 2 was put into place, was the first year that farmers actually started to make, have an income. And having that income, they have actually turned a profit uh, the last seven years as they have been producing corn and beans to sell to the marketplace. As a result of that, the federal payments that have been made to farmers have been significantly reduced to the tune of about 15 to 16 billion a year that doesn't go to farmers. Just a quick touch on uh, where we stand as a competitive mo molecule. Again, ethanol adds octane and oxygen to the fuel supply. Uh, it is the most highly rated, uh, cheapest molecule you can find out there today. If you look at the lower left-hand corner, uh, and actually this ethanol was trading closer to $1.45 a gallon today. So you can look at ethanol's price versus other uh, petroleum-based uh, octane and oxygenates that you can buy. And it is the only uh, octane or oxygen that can be purchased and put into the fuel supply in any, any size of qu uh, quantity. Uh, one of the key things as we talk about uh, ozone here in Omaha and around the country, it has been, and the EPA is certainly uh, a big supporter of ethanol, been the biggest reason why we've seen tailpipe emissions be reduced in our major metropolitan areas. We think about corn, there's three parts to corn. Uh, you've got the starch, is what we take to make into a sugar. We convert into a sugar and ferment into, into alcohol. There's the protein and fiber, which we dry, and again, we sell that. That's the livestock feed. And then there's the CO2 that got captured as that corn was growing. And today, most modern-day ethanol plants just release that corn into uh, the atmosphere. So I'm going to actually jump forward a couple of slides because I want to kind of key on this more than anything. Uh, today, Green Plains has a project in Shenandoah, Iowa, where we're taking the CO2 directly off of the ethanol plant, and we're feeding that into these grower harvesters you see in the top right of this, of this screen. Those are basically greenhouses where, and then if you look at the picture below, we've got, um, and that's a 400-foot reactor, where we are growing algae, feeding at the CO2 right out of the, uh, out of the fermentation process off the ethanol plant, as you can see in the background up there. Uh, we're taking the sunlight that's available, we can use the excess heat, warm water from the plant, and grow this product. Uh, what does this mean for us? Uh, today it means that we can extend that life cycle of CO2 that is being generated. You can never get rid of CO2. You need to do something with it. So the CO2 we release is a byproduct of the, of the corn and, and when it was growing. So today, 
uh, we believe that we'll have and have good success so far with capturing that CO2 and growing algae. Uh, the focus of the project has been initially for uh, feed and for food and pharmaceuticals. But uh, early last year, in April of 2013, the Department of Energy approached us and we were awarded a $6.4 million grant to partner with the DOE uh, to produce and look at producing algae that could be used to turn into fuel. Uh, it's been a very successful pilot. Uh, we have met all the milestones that the DOD set out for us in the, in the process. Right now we're in the final planning stages and looking to invest somewhere between 10 to $20 million uh, for the next phase of this project. Uh, and for Green Plains, as a 63% owner of the venture, uh, we're hopeful that the DOE will want to step up and be, and be a part of that as we go forward. Yeah, just another kind of quick, quick look at the algae project. Um, we've had uh, successful growth since 2009 when it was first launched with the ethanol plant in Shenandoah. We have the ability to uh, stress the, the algae in various ways. Uh, there's not been a, a strain of algae that we couldn't grow, uh, whether it be salt, uh, fresh water, whether it be uh, red, brown, or green. We've had uh, good success. And as you notice on the last slide, uh, growing these in those greenhouses, we can grow various strains at, at one time. And it's also a, it's a closed process. So unlike some other algae producers that use a pond process, and can worry about contamination from birds flying over or frogs jumping in, we don't have that issue with our approach to the, to the project. One of the other aspects of what we do, so kind of go back to the life cycle of, of corn ethanol. So today, again, we, we're taking the first two-thirds of that kernel and we're producing quite a few project products out of that. So now we can also turn around and take the corn sugar that we generate as part of the fermentation process and throw that back into uh, a mixotrophic environment to where uh, autotrophic has been, was the first primary approach we took, which is exposing the algae, taking the algae out into the sunlight. But now we can introduce uh, corn sugar and actually kind of supercharge that algae as it grows and, and actually and can supercharge it at night uh, and have, have had good growth rates and good success with that. This is uh, going to take us to our la my last slide, and uh, basically what I want to do is just leave up here uh, before I introduce the next speaker what, uh, what the life cycle of producing ethanol looks like versus the life cycle of producing gasoline. Uh, this slide is uh, pretty much to us a pretty telling slide in this, from the standpoint of when you look at uh, the energy that it takes to come up with uh, the million uh, BTU of gasoline versus a million BTU of ethanol. Ethanol, uh, at the end of the day, is less energy intensive than it is to produce in mine petroleum. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that and uh, introduce uh, Scott Williams, uh, who is with the Omaha Biofuels Co-op. Thank you a lot, Jim. Oh, well, pardon me if I can't shake your hand. Brought a couple of visual aids with me today. All right, my name is Scott Williams. I'm the managing director of the Omaha Biofuels Cooperative, and we're here in Omaha, Nebraska. And we collect used cooking oil from restaurants around town and recycle it for biofuels purposes. Nope. Here we go. If you're interested in getting in touch with me, you can hit me in my email address. You can give us a call. Today's uh, streaming uh, conference is uh, on Twitter, so you can follow us there, or you can check us out on Facebook. All the material I'm presenting is available with the Creative Commons license, BYNCSA. So, in general, the advantages of biofuels are pretty clear. Um, at the tailpipe, we have cleaner burning fuels. There's less pollution at the pump, at the tank, and coming out of the tailpipe. The fuel feedstocks are renewable, and they can be produced in a sustainable cycle, rather than a one-directional line that is consumed in a finite quantity. Biofuels are, in general, considered something close to carbon neutral in that the carbon dioxide from the air is consumed by the plants, which ends up in oils or sugars, which ends up in fuels, in engines, in tailpipes, and back into the air. And a carbon cycle is not particularly detrimental to our climate and will not cause further climate change. It's only the one-directional line of fossil carbon into our atmosphere from underground that actually causes a problem. 
So carbon neutral fuels are a great, great way to address the ever mounting challenges of climate change. And lastly, um, biofuels can be locally sourced and produced. They're domestically available fuels like Jim just talked about. And they can even be created right in the local economy, such as here in Omaha. So there are two main biofuels that are the biggest part of the game today in the United States energy economy. Um, first and foremost, the largest, as Jim talked about, is corn ethanol. Corn ethanol is a gasoline replacement for a spark ignition type of engine. And gasoline is about 130 billion gallons per year of demand for gasoline. Approximately 14 billion gallons of ethanol is produced every year. So almost 10% of our gasoline is being met by the ethanol that's being produced right now. And largely that is coming from corn sources. Um, you can no you'll notice cars that are corn ethanol approved are tagged with flex fuel, and that means they can use not only just 10% ethanol as an additive to fuel, but they can actually use 85, E85, 85% ethanol fuel. And this is a pretty common standard at this point. Asking a dealer for an E85 flex fuel car is just about like saying you want your car in blue. They just say, no problem, it'll be here next week. The other major biofuel currently is soy, soy biodiesel. Uh, the diesel market is about 55 billion gallons a year, and current soy biodiesel production is about 1.3 gallons, 1.3 billion gallons per year. So in total numbers, biodiesel is a much smaller market at present than corn ethanol. And additionally, in fractions, a smaller fraction of the diesel market is currently being met with biodiesel or um, with soy-based biodiesel. So these are first-generation biofuels. That means they come from food crops. And there are a couple of um, limitations to what we can do with first-generation biofuels. Um, one of the things is the energy return on investment, the EROI. Jim mentioned it briefly, that ethanol, for every gallon of fuel you put in, can get out about 1.3 gallons of fuel back. That's great. That's a 30% return on your investment. But a lot of times you compare that to what we have been doing in the past. And even right now, conventional oil still has an EROI of about 10 to 1. For every energy unit you put into producing gasoline, you get about 10 units of gasoline back out. Of course, I put a special, special note here, EROI takes no consideration for carbon pollution. So the reason that you can get such a fantastic return of fossil fuels is because over millions of years, the sunlight was stored energy under the ground in fossil fuels, and we are now releasing that energy. So you get a great return in the short term, but you're changing the carbon balance of our planet, and it's having major impacts on our climate. Soy biodiesel can get a little bit better EROI. Um, it's based on a little bit higher oil yield per acre for soy as compared to the sugar and starch yield for corn per acre. And so you can get a little bit better EROI with soy biodiesel. Both of these are going to have a food versus fuel conflict. That is to say, either directly this would have been food in someone's mouth, or indirectly this might have been feed in an animal's mouth, which would have become food in a person's mouth or even more indirectly, in the use of arable lands that would have otherwise been potentially available for food production. So both of these fuels do have that food versus fuel um, conflict that needs to be resolved because we have a demand for food and a demand for fuel, and we need to find the appropriate balance in our nation and worldwide. And the thirdly, a lot of first-generation biofuels um, are uh, very intensive use of resources, particularly considering water. Um, hundreds of gallons of water are used to produce a gallon of ethanol fuel in irrigation, and a lot of that goes to evaporation. Um, fertilizers, fossil fuel-derived fertilizers, are poured onto fields in order to create agricultural crops that we use for food and feed and fuel. Additionally, we use phosphorus, and somebody out there might have actually heard the term peak phosphorus. Phosphorus is something that we mine and put on fields then it ends up in rivers, and we have a finite amount of it. And at some point, it will be a resource constraint. And lastly, runoff, fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides that we put on crops end up in our watershed and ironically run down and form algae blooms in places like the Gulf of Mexico, which is a little bit ironic because we'll talk later about the fact that algae can actually be a fantastic um, resource and feedstock for fuels. So we're the Omaha Biofuels Cooperative. Our motto is to produce, use, and promote biofuels. We are established in 2008. And we are a not-for-profit entity. We are not a tax-exempt nonprofit entity because the IRS doesn't consider fuel production to be a 501c3 exempt purpose. But we are not doing this for the purpose of financial return to any owners or stakeholders or investors of any kind. The whole purpose is to produce, use, and promote biofuels. Anytime revenues exceed expenses, the money is just put right back into doing one of those three tasks. We're cooperative, so we're member-owned and operated. That means that the owners are the workers, are the customers, and all of those are the members of our cooperative. 
And we're the first organization in Nebraska to receive a fuel producer consumer license to an organization. Um, that means that we are not a public fuel retail station. We're not a Phillips 66 or a Conoco. No, not just anyone can pull up and fill up their tank with us. You need to be a member of the organization because our license entitles members to produce fuel and our license entitles members to consume fuel. But the membership is open to the public. Anyone could be a member of our organization. So the way we operate in general is we collect waste vegetable oil, WVO, from restaurants. So here's one of our members with 50 gallon barrels outside of a restaurant. After about two weeks, a fryer's oil needs to be changed. The cooks will come and pour it out of the barrels. And after about a month, the barrel will be filled with around 50 gallons of oil. We'll bring our truck, we'll swap out the barrels, we'll leave a new clean one with the locked lid on the top, and we'll take the full one back to our facility for further processing. Ooh, I'm sorry. This way. So waste vegetable oil processing looks something like screening and straining to remove the really large chunks, any heavy creams and really water-dense fractions of the oil, any bits of french fries or fish sticks that are left over. And then settling, which is what you can see here. The settling is um, the tanks are cone-shaped tanks, and all the heavies will fall down to the bottom of the tanks. And um, so that th those are smaller particles in water. Fortunately, all of the stuff we don't want in the oil is heavier than the oil and falls out. And then we filter, which removes the smallest particles, and it makes it ready for the oil to be used as a fuel or as a reactant. So waste vegetable oil as a fuel looks like a couple of things. In external combustion, like in a boiler, for instance, you can burn vegetable oil pretty readily because a boiler is a relatively old, low technology method of combustion. You just have a flame, and the flame heats the sealed container that generates steam to heat a building or maybe drive some sort of engine. So that flame is relatively easy to use vegetable oil to create a flame. But vegetable oil is too thick to burn cleanly and efficiently in modern diesel. We've had more than 100 years of co-development between the diesel fuel and the diesel engine. As the engine technology advances, higher pressures, smaller injector nozzle sizes, finer mists to get better miles per gallon and to get more clean burns and more efficiency, lower emissions, the fuel has been continuously refined to improve along with the engine. But what that means is we now have a coupled system of modern diesel engines that are really only specifically tailored for modern petroleum diesel fuel. So waste vegetable oil is a little bit too thick to be effectively burned through nozzle injectors. There are a few cases where people will convert their cars, their diesel cars, to grease cars. That is to say, if you take the coolant from the engine and run it through the oil tank, then you can warm up the oil enough that the viscosity lowers and you can get a fine spray of oil in your nozzles and get a more efficient burn. But it's around $1,000 or $1,500 to convert a vehicle, and that's um, cost-effective wise. It's sometimes not always the, the best investment. Some folks do it. This is a rock group who drove through Omaha in a, in a van that they converted, a big E350, and they had a veg oil tank on that, and we filled them up as they continued on their rock and roll tour across the country. The next one was the Great March for Climate Action, who came through Omaha about 10 weeks ago. They also had a truck. This is a substantially older truck from the mid-80s with large nozzles and a really easy time burning vegetable oil. So in some cases, vegetable oil is directly useful as a fuel. But in a lot of cases, we use vegetable oil to produce biodiesel. Biodiesel answers the problem of vegetable oil being too thick because we cut the molecule into smaller pieces. Biodiesel is a drop-in replacement for diesel cars, trucks, generators, trains, anything that's got diesel fuel in it can put biodiesel in it. In any amount, it can be splash blended directly in the tank, and you can switch back and forth at any time, and the engine will run the exact same as it did with the petroleum diesel. The process, and this is my only really big and technical word in my presentation, is called transesterification. Trans meaning cross, ester meaning the name of the bond inside the molecule. And so what we have is we have a combination of about four parts vegetable oil and one part alcohol. We heat up the vegetable oil and the alcohol, and then we mix them vigorously. And so in the middle, you can see that we're mixing and heating. And then after the reaction takes place, in about five minutes of mixing and heating, we let the jar sit. And after about 30 minutes, you can see that the glycerol will fall right down. That's the backbone of the oil molecule, and it falls right down off the biodiesel. And this is such a simple reaction that you can do it in a kitchen. We do this routinely in classrooms. It's actually very easy. And the jars you see right there are the ones directly in front of me today. So this is an unreacted mixture. There's alcohol still sitting on the top because this jar wasn't heated. It's just been mixed. If you heat and mix and let it sit, you can see that biodiesel and glycerol have formed here. The biodiesel is much thinner across the top 
and the glycerol is much thicker and insoluble and falls down to the bottom. The thinner biodiesel is then actually a great replacement for petroleum diesel in any diesel engine. This can be done commercially with, uh, this can be done with commercially available equipment such as the BioPro, which is made by an organization called Springboard Biodiesel. It, you can see the size there relative to the size of a person. It's about 380 liters, which is 100 gallons. It takes about 12 hours to run. So you fill it up with four parts vegetable oil and one part alcohol. It mixes, it heats, it checks the chemistry, and then it settles. And most of that 12-hour time is the settling time. The reaction time is only about one hour. And then it sits for 12 hours waiting to settle. And then you open the valve on the bottom and the glycerin drains away, and you have the biodiesel left over to be used for fuel. We also do a fair amount of outreach and education with the cooperative, um, including lectures like we're doing right here. So we do this in classrooms quite a lot. We have a good kit that we can take. For instance, this was Earth Day of this year. And we do this in classrooms all over relatively safe, easy to do, fast. And it really gives people an idea of how simple of a chemistry this is and how tangible of a fuel option this can become. There's one limitation to what we do, and that is use cooking oil, UCO, as a fuel source. We are adding to a value to the waste product. And it is a tangible way to engage people about biofuels, but the used cooking oil market is relatively small. In fact, it's severely limited. The rule of thumb is about one gallon of used cooking oil per person per year, which if you eat a lot of french fries, seems like maybe a low number. But nationwide, that's about the average for the number of people and the amount of oil we have. And the demand for fuel, nationwide per capita fuel demand, is about 750 gallons per person per year. So obviously, used cooking oil is never going to be the major factor in the country. But there are other advanced biofuels that we can take a look at. There are a couple of next generation biofuels that I wanted to briefly talk about. Cellulosic ethanol is one. Algae green crude is another. And then algae biodiesel at the bottom. Cellulosic ethanol is when you use the um, structural and inedible parts of biomass. Woods, grasses, corn stover, that's what this picture is. It's like a picture of you know, harvested corn last week in a field. And those things are not useful for food. And they're not particularly valuable in very many applications, but they can be used to produce cellulosic ethanol. And so this is value adding to a low value or even a waste product. Waste sawdust from a sawmill could be turned into cellulosic ethanol. Uh, the first two commercial scale facilities are being completed in Iowa right now. And just in July of 2014, the very first commercial cellulosic ethanol facility made its first gallons of ethanol. And so this is coming online now and starting to be um, a reliable and competitive fuel that can enter our biofuel. Small but close. Well, fuel some algae. Algae is considered a second generation source because it's not a food, at least not in any great extent. People take spirulina tablets, but algae is not basically a food. And it can be grown on non-arable land. And that's the real significant difference between soy or corn, is that soy or corn might be foods themselves or might be supplanting other food crops. But algae, but algae is grown on lands that can never have been crops to begin with, because algae doesn't actually need the dirt. It only needs the water and the sun and the nutrients. It's fertilizer which you put in the pond. So you get remarkably high yields from algae. Soy can give you about 70 gallons of oil per acre per year. Algae can yield something like 3,000 gallons per acre per year. And quite a lot of researchers put that number closer to 10,000. I'm being relatively conservative compared to most uh, algae researchers when I say 3,000 gallons per acre per year. So that's the promise of algae. What's it look like? The largest operation is run currently by Sapphire Energy. They operate a 300-acre green food farm in New Mexico. They've gotten support from the federal government, Department of Energy, to the tune of around $500 million over the last few years, loans which they have been paying back and are continuing to pay back because the project is going particularly well. You can see these are large raceway ponds, and this is, from an aerial shot, about 300 acres worth of a farm, the first sort of commercial farm to actually produce algae as a crop. Sapphire's method is to process the whole algae into a green crude, which is a drop-in replacement for petroleum in refineries. And so that's going to go into the top of the refinery and then can be refined as a bio-based source into any of the products that petroleum could be refined into. Gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, plastics, all the things you can make from petroleum can come from this green crude. On the other hand, you can separate the oily component away from the algae, much in the way that you press a soybean. You've got lipids which are oils and fats, and you want to separate those away from the other two major biomass components, carbohydrates and proteins. And these can be separated apart, and then the oil can be used as a higher value added feedstock. So here's a solvent separation where you can see the wet algae on the bottom has been separated into a water layer 
a protein and carbohydrate biomass on the bottom that's insoluble, and then a solvent that has dissolved all of the lipids and stays separated up to the top of the tube. The algae oil could be processed like waste vegetable oil through transesterification to make biodiesel or through more complex processes like hydrothermal, um, any hydrothermal process to make more complex types of fuel products. So there's me with a little tiny bit of algae oil that I extracted recently while I was working at John Hopkins. I look forward to the question and answer period. I'd be happy to talk more about this. Please tweet at us, SLPS Thursday. You can always send me an email if you want to talk more about this and get engaged. And with that, um, I will turn this over to Bill Moore of EV World. He's going to talk more about electricity in our transportation infrastructure. Thank you, Scott. That is absolutely fascinating. I hope what, uh, what I have to say is uh, equally as fascinating. Uh, I have a, uh, a short video that I would like to, uh, to play uh, in just a minute. I would like to say I am, uh, this is old stomping grounds. I actually grew up in this neck of Omaha, a 1965 graduate of uh, North High School and used to walk past Fort here uh, every day. So uh, it's kind of like being back home again. So you can play that. Well, again, thank you very much. If we can uh, bring the uh, Futures Electric slide up. Um, again, I'm the publisher of EVWorld.com. I've been uh, publishing EV World for going on 17 years now, and uh, it's been a, an interesting and educational ride for me. So let's go to the next slide. Or maybe I can, uh, yeah, why don't I use this, see if this works. Okay, what are all of these six different, up? Oh, did I do something? Okay. Okay, and let's see here if I can do page down. Okay, there we go. What do these six things have in common? You're always supposed to ask an interesting question. I'm not going to tell you the answer until we get to the end, but I'll let you think about it. Okay, so I've got, uh, oh, all right, got to roll right along here. I've got three parts of this I'd like to discuss with you. I'd like to talk about electric vehicles. Are they a sales success or a sales failure? Because you hear both views. And uh, I'd like to, uh, you know, we'll, we'll try to set the record straight to uh, let you know which is, happens to be the case. Next part is where will the power come from? This is kind of another controversial area. How do we power these things? Uh, are they as green as uh, some people say they are? And then finally, what about rural electric vehicles? Obviously, we have an audience out in uh, rural Nebraska and elsewhere. Uh, you know, we, when, I, when I write about electric vehicles and talk about them, I tend to think about cars in the city. Uh, what about in, out in the, uh, the rural community? What, what role might electric vehicles play out there? Okay, part one, sales success or failure? The two most popular electric drive, and I'm going to define that as any vehicle that is propelled substantially by an electric motor as opposed to uh, a Chevrolet Malibu with auto stop start system or a Buick uh, LaCrosse that has a similar what they call e-assist system. These are vehicles that are propelled essentially uh, much of the time uh, by electric drive. So you've got two of the most popular ones up here. This is up on the upper right hand corner is the Nissan Leaf. Uh, they've sold about 60,000 of those in the United States since the car was introduced. Uh, in late 2010, right around the same time the LEAP was introduced, Chevrolet introduced the Volt, uh, the lower uh, left-hand corner here, both of those, again, about 60,000 units. Uh, I know we have one gentleman here, my neighbor, uh, who absolutely actually drives a Chevrolet Volt. You drive it up? I assume you may have driven it up here, so, okay. Okay, it's in the lot. Oh, not charging yet. we got to get a charger for it then, right? Okay, so that's pretty good numbers. I mean, that's not runaway. When General Motors introduced uh, the, the Volt, uh, the numbers they were talking about was we were going to do about uh, 20,000 the first year. Uh, they did about 10. Second year, they said we'd do 45. And by the third and fourth year, we'd be turning out 60,000 uh, of these vehicles a year. Um, and they converted the plant over in, uh, in Detroit, which I've had the opportunity to go to, uh, you know, with that thought in mind. Obviously, 
uh, they've not quite done that. They're doing about 2,500 cars. Excuse me, about 2,500 cars a month, both of these companies. Okay, these are the, actually, when we think about electric vehicles, we tend to think what's, you know, the LEAF was the first modern electric vehicle. In fact, actually, the first modern electric vehicle, we could go back to the EV1, but I'm not even, that's, that's ancient history now. The first modern electric vehicle to actually hit the road was the Mitsubishi IMAV. I had a chance to drive that in Tokyo back in 2007. The most, the newest electric vehicle to be announced is the uh, Kia Soul EV, uh, which uh, just uh, got introduced um, here recently, as a matter of fact. Nowhere nearly, at this point at least, as successful as the Volt or the Leaf. Uh, Ford Motor Company makes a, uh, an electric version of their Ford Focus. Um, they're starting to sell those in somewhat reasonable, I think around 1,500 vehicles a month. Uh, the newest one to be introduced is the BMW i3. Uh, if you're interested in this particular, all, all, all of these, by the way, are all electric. The only plug-in hybrid that I've talked about at this point is the Volt. Uh, the all-electric BMW, if you uh, run over to uh, Markle, I'm sure they'd be happy to let you uh, hop in one and take it for a spin. I did that, and it was a lot of fun. Of course, the car that gets talked about by everybody is the Tesla uh, cars. Uh, the first one, of course, was the Roadster, which is essentially a little two-seat sports car that um, they built about 2,500 of those based on the Lotus Elise. Um, then they rolled out their own from the ground design built vehicle, the Model S, which is the car on the left. Uh, uh, they sold, I think about, uh, I read just recently, they did about 2,500 of these last month. So they're starting to get those numbers up. The car to the right of that is the, uh, the new Model X with what they call the Falcon doors. And if you're wondering how do those doors close, the whole point of doing this exercise was, in fact, you can open the doors and close the doors with cars parked that close the way they have engineered them. This will be their SUV, or well, their crossover style vehicle. Uh, that should become, start to become available early next year. Again, these are rather expensive cars, and we'll talk about economics. Uh, you're going to lay down somewhere $80,000, $90,000 roughly, and if you get all the bells and whistles, you're looking over $100,000 for these cars. These also, by the way, are the only cars on the market that will do in excess of 200 miles on a charge. All the other cars are in the 70 to 80 to 100 mile range per charge. These cars will do well over that. In fact, uh, most uh, these cars have been driven all the way from uh, east coast to the west coast, west coast to the east coast. I interviewed a couple of guys out of Louisiana that decided to drive one to the Panama Canal, and uh, they in fact drove it from the Mexico border, Laredo, all the way to the, the Panama Canal. So. Um, they've got the range, they have the capability that is comparable and competitive with a gasoline car. These are cars you probably will never see here in Nebraska. These are essentially what are called compliance cars to meet California zero emission vehicle uh, mandates. So they build only enough cars to meet the mandate uh, set in California. Uh, the, the, the exception, I, I suppose, would be the, uh, the uh, smart car. Uh, that you can buy elsewhere or at least outside of California. The Chevrolet Spark, below it, all electric. The Honda Fit, again, all electric, but that's only available in California. And then above, uh, upper right-hand corner is the Fiat 500e, which is an all-electric version of, of the little Fiat 500. Uh, getting into a, a class of vehicles that we call plug-in electric vehicles, PHEV or another term uh, is extended range electric vehicle, or EREV, is the BMW i8. That's about a $130,000 automobile. And then the one below it is the Cadillac ELR. That's about an $80,000 vehicle. And driving, uh, not down here today, but week week and a half ago, uh, I actually passed one of these. I got to see my first one. Somebody here in Omaha has one. so. These are all vehicles that have an internal combustion engine that acts as a generator to extend the range of the car, which is why they call it extended range. So you drive so many miles on electric, and then the motor kicks in, spins the generator, keeps the battery charged, and you can drive on as long as you've got gasoline uh, in the tank. 
BMW, the i3, offers both an all-electric version and then they also offer an extended range version, which does essentially, excuse me, the same thing. These are just a, a partial list. I didn't include uh, really any of the smaller and any of the Chi any of the Chinese manufacturers. Uh, uh, BYD being the only exception up there. Um, every one of these car makers has some form of electric pro program going. Once upon a time, it was just a handful. You count on one hand. Now you've got all of these guys have some project in the works. Okay, got to move along. So how have sales of these things gone? This is a graph that shows the blue line shows the first 30 months of sales after the introduction of the Honda Insight and the original Toyota Prius. The line above it, the gold colored line, is sales of all the of the electric vehicles since their introduction 30 months ago. And you see that the electric vehicles are doing about selling about twice the rate of what the hybrids did when they were first introduced. Other way. This is another chart on the left showing you a similar thing with all the various models combined into a graph, uh, showing the uh, the rate to which since they were introduced at the end of 2010 up until uh, 2013. I put the other graph in to sort of help explain why in re why we're seeing some of this growth taking place because we're seeing a drop in the cost of the battery, which is the largest costliest component of any electric vehicle. And an automobile, what you buy is an empty tank. I mean, the, the dealer gives you some gasoline. But you're essentially buying an empty tank. You then fill that tank with energy over the course of the ownership of the vehicle. In the case of an electric vehicle, you, in essence, are actually buying much of your energy at the beginning in the form of that battery. And then you're topping that off periodically from the power grid. So that's one reason why they tend to be a little bit more expensive. But as you can see there, the costs are coming down. This chart represents what the uh, Electric Power Research Institute thinks is going to happen over the course of time. The more electric cars that we build, the lower the battery costs become. It's sort of what I call the plasma TV effect. You remember plasma TVs, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars a decade ago. Now. You can't buy a regular cathode ray TV. They're you know, cheap, uh, L cheap LEDs and plasmas uh, are what's available because of that, that mass of production. Oh, other way. OK, part two. So where's the energy coming from for an electric vehicle? Well, obviously, the first place it comes from is the electricity that comes into your house. Into your house. Uh, this shows you uh, one, of the, one of the criticisms of, of, uh, of an electric vehicle is, well, they use all this energy. It's like if my neighbor buys an electric car, it's like they have now put in another great big air conditioner next to me because it takes that much energy to charge one of these vehicles. It's like having another house built next door in some respects. And, and so that's true. Electric vehicle uh, people charging their, not, their vehicles at night do, in fact, use more electricity than their neighbors do. But there's an awful lot of energy that's, that's available at night that isn't being used. And so we've got plenty of capacity. An estimate was done several years ago that we could power virtually all of the American car fleet with just the excess grid power that's available at night, similar to this chart here. Got to move along. OK, there's a little thing called the, uh, one of the criticisms being electric cars dirty secret, that here in, in the Midwest we use coal, and therefore they're not really any cleaner than a gasoline car. In some respects, there is some truth to that, but the gasoline car we're talking about is not your average 24 mile an hour, 24 miles per gallon car. We're talking about driving a hybrid at 43 to 50 miles per gallon, as this chart shows. What they're showing there is the concentration of power in the grid coming from coal as opposed to further out west where they have much more hydropower. And of course, obviously, cleaner vehicles. OK, this chart's a little hard to see in this light, but basically what we're seeing here is that we're seeing a drop in the price of solar and a gradual rising price in the cost of electricity coming off the grid. And guess what? Right around 2014, those lines start to cross. And oh, I guess in this particular version, I forgot to update this. I did include in, in another version of this. There should be another chart in there showing you where electricity is now, solar electricity is now compatible with 
the grid, states of Texas, uh, and some others. Unfortunately, I didn't get it in there. But the point is, is that we're really getting to the point to where this power can uh, very soon start to come from the grid. In fact, the gentleman here in the audience with the Volt actually charges his with solar panels um, in his home in Papillion. Okay, so uh, we're running short on, in fact, actually over time, so let me just really cut this short. Uh, am I okay? All right, good. Um, one, of the, one of the concerns about it, obviously, solar is that it only shines at night, and I'm at work, how do I charge my car? If I park it in the garage at night, what do I do? Well, our friends at Tesla solved that problem. If you look over the back of Randy's shoulder, you're seeing a Tesla battery bank. So they not only make cars, they also are now getting in through, through their affiliation with Solar City into battery banks, and that's one of the things that they plan on doing with that great big giga plant out in uh, outside of Reno. So take the energy at night, or take the energy during the day, store it at night, and then when I plug my car in at night, I use the energy that I've stored in the Tesla battery bank. Okay, here's cost comparisons. I don't know if you've ever seen a Moroni sticker. These are, you know, the stickers we see on the side of the car, are technically they're called Moroni stickers. Um, this is a Moroni sticker for a, a Nissan Leaf, showing you the cost to run that car compared to if you were going to run it by uh, using electricity. In this case, over the course of the life of the vehicle, you'd save $9,600, which goes a long way to offsetting the cost of that battery. Uh, this is a similar chart put together by the uh, Sierra Club, showing the differences in price cost savings. Um, and this report came out uh, just this week. The average U.S. household spends $2,800 in gasoline last year. That's an 111% increase over last decade. Put solar on your house. Once it's paid for, you never see a price, price rise again. So that, in, in essence, I think is where we're headed. Part three, what about rural electricity? What about rural, you know, what, what role might they have? Years ago, I interviewed the guy that converted this. This is a Chalmers G tractor that he took. He does, he does truck farming in the Hudson Valley of New York. He converted this Chalmers G, took the old diesel engine off the back, and put an electric motor, bolted it right in to the, the transmission on the back of this thing, and then put a bunch of lead-acid batteries on the back to, to, hold, to hold the thing down. Not visible in this photograph is a trailer with solar panels mounted on it that he pulls out into the field. He plugs the tractor in. He charges the tractor with the solar panels, and then he fills his, his truck garden. Obviously, you know, you're not going to do large swaths of ground with, uh, with this thing. But in truck farmer application, uh, it's a you know, piece of brilliant engineering, I think. But long before NASA ever put a fuel cell in a spaceship, for example, Apollo mission, Alice Chalmers had a fuel cell in a tractor, 1959. So a fuel cell, of course, maybe we can get into that in the panels. We don't have time right now. But a fuel cell is one of those things where the byproduct, as I was telling the guys, this is the byproduct of a fuel cell, water. That's what it emits. So Alice Chalmers did that. 60 years later, uh, New Holland introduced a uh, prototype, also a fuel cell tractor that would run off of hydrogen. And of course, then uh, this is a, a John Deere uh, robotic tractor that may be this is what the future of farming might look like 20, 30 years in the future. We already have tractors that are GPS guided. They guide themselves. We just power them with electricity. We power them with a fuel cell. You program them, they go do what they do. This could be what the electric vehicles in the farm community of the future look like. Okay, coming back real quickly as we wrap up here to, uh, to uh, the, the future of transportation urban environment, because here in about 30 years, there's about 65 to 70 percent of us are going to end up living in cities anyway. Uh, so how are we going to be getting around? This is what the uh, automobile dealers are thinking, or automobile designers are thinking. Uh, you see a Nissan vehicle there. This is a self-balancing uh, two-person electric vehicle down here called the uh, C1. The vehicle, the Toyota iRoad, is actually starting, is going to be part of a demonstration share program in France starting um, this fall. So that vehicle's already in existence. 
and not just a concept. So they're trying to think ahead, what are our cars going to look like? And by the way, these are all electric. And so are these. That's the common thing. These vehicles are all electric. You've got a bus. You've got Google's uh, robotic self-driving uh, car. You've got a drone, which, by the way, DHL announced last week they're going to be start doing deliveries to an island off of Germany using drones to make their package deliveries. You've got a submarine. I actually had a chance to inter in interview the engineer, um, Mr. Hawks, uh, on the, uh, the underwater submersible. You've got an electric airplane. This is an Airbus project. And then you've got BMW's Evolution Scooter. So again, they're all electric. That's what the future of transportation looks like. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for all the presentations. Um, we actually will do a Q&A, so I'll, I'll ask that uh, Jim, Scott, and Bill join us up front. Actually, if we could pull this table over as well. Um, Jim brought some props, too, uh, to show the difference uh, between traditional fuel sources and uh, what his company is producing. Yeah. You guys grab that and I'll grab the table. How's that? Okay. Got it? Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much. And uh, how are we looking on? Uh, do we have any questions from? OK, perfect. Well, perfect. Have a seat. Um, so just to get things started, uh, we talked about a lot of the benefits of your fuel sources. Uh, a couple of you mentioned uh, limitations, but I wondered if you could speak to the limitations of your fuel and maybe how um, the others at the table could help uh, overcome some of those limitations. What's your greatest weakness? That's right. I try to hard. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll start. I'll take a shot at myself. Um, biodiesel is a great option for a drop-in replacement diesel in a lot of cases, but one of the major limitations is actually one that's common in petroleum vehicles too. Um, diesel fuels need to be winterized. Anybody who has a diesel vehicle knows that you need to buy winterized diesel in the winter. And petroleum diesel is winterized with a higher going kerosene of the fuel, and the stations just do it automatically. You don't when you get there to the pump in October, it's winterized fuel, and it's like that all in the trade flow. Mm. You wouldn't even know. You have to ask, and they don't even know the station. Biodiesel will have a similar problem. It's called gelling. Um, it's not really freezing into a solid, but it will get thick and gel. And biodiesel is made of vegetable oils, and the vegetable oil change and gel at a temperature that is higher than petroleum diesel. Um, and so that is a consideration that you need to be aware of when you work with biodiesel. Mm. There are engineers and labs all over the world who are working to try and fix this to learn how to better winterize biodiesel and make it available and appropriate for climates like Nebraska. When we get down to minus 20, minus 30 maybe one night, mm -hmm. and you've got a big block of jelly in your tank, that's it's going to ruin the whole reason. Yeah. Um, so they're, 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 the best thing you can do is you just blend down. Okay. Right? Instead of using B100 like you might during the summer, you can just blend down to maybe B10 or B5 or something during the summer in a particularly hard climate like Nebraska. Live in San Diego, B100 year-round. But that is one of the limitations of biodiesel. Perfect. And Jim, does sure. corn ethanol have any limitations? Well, our limitations come from who our customers are. Okay. We're an industry that sells to big oil. And uh, for, for the folks around the table, uh, questions to think about is, how long does it take for the fleet to turn over? Uh, so Bill's talking about 30, 40 years in the future. Yeah. So we needed a fuel that could be dropped in today. And that's where ethanol delivered. But it does have its limitations because big oil doesn't want to give up any more of the gas tank. Mm -hmm. and it's a constant fight. We fight day in and day out to try to get higher blends introduced into the marketplace. Uh, I use Brazil as an example. You can go look. Brazil has had uh, high blends of ethanol for decades. Uh, they're currently at E25, 25% ethanol, going to 27.5% next year. It's already been approved. How can they drive the same Fords, GMs, and Toyotas that they sell here, but big oil and the autos want to scare you into believing that you can't use more ethanol in the fuel here? So 
honestly, our weakness is that. Uh, when it comes to growing the crop, uh, farmers here in the Midwest have responded. Uh, there was one year that the corn crop was short. Yes, corn prices went up. It wasn't a result of ethanol. It was a result of a drought, a 50-year drought. Uh, corn crop came in this past year, record crop. We're staring at another record crop. How did we get there? All the, all of the corn seed producers, the Syngentos and Monsantos and those guys of the world, have figured out how to get higher yielding uh, generations of seed out there. We're looking at close to 100, 172, maybe 173 bushels per acre this year. That's how the farmer has gotten to be profitable, can pay his way, and it's not dependent on being subsidized by the by the federal government. Perfect. And and Bill, any any weaknesses in yep. uh, energy density? Okay, that's the biggest problem. And what what I mean by that is, if you look at these fuels up here. These are all relatively energy dense sources. So I, you can take a small quantity of your ethanol, your biodiesel and things, and you can got, do a lot of work with that. Um, in, the case of, uh, in the case of battery technology, we measure that density is typically a tenth that of, of in fact, that's even better, that's, that's pretty good actually, uh, of, uh, of, of, of a gallon of gasoline, for example. So an electric vehicle has to be extraordinarily more efficient than do other conventional vehicles. The great deal of work is being done to take and improve that density so that we get closer to the density of a liquid fuel. Uh, in that case, then we've got vehicles that instead of doing 70, 80 miles before you have to charge them up, we can uh, do vehicles that uh, you know, are typically uh, the magic 300 miles or 500 miles. Those are what we would consider second or third generation batteries from where we are right now. So energy density of, of the battery is a big drawback, holdback right now. So you, it sounds like each of the transportation fuels have some, um, uh, I, I guess I want to say weather has some impact on your transportation. So if EVs went to solar, right, it gets dark. Um, corn ethanol, if there's a flood or there's a drought, knocks out the crop, um, similar with, with biodiesel uh, or some other biofuels. What, um, how do you hedge against that? I mean, we have a, a consistent um, process that we pull from the ground. It doesn't, you know, uh, weather doesn't impact those fuels. Um, but if we want to move to that future, how do we, um, how do, how, what are your technologies doing to hedge against well, climate change? The, the resource that you're referring to, of course, you know, petroleum generally. Um, is is a what we think is a re, is a finite resource. Certainly, in terms of the amount of time it takes to create these fuels, are astronomical billions and billions of years. And we have, within the last 150 years, we've basically been taking out of that savings account that we've had, and we're you know burning it in, in a fairly rapid succession, which is. CO2 problem that, that we're talking about here. We'd be fine if we could rely just strictly on, you know, the corns and, and, and the, the wheats and, and the sorghums and, and those kinds of the stovers and things, because that's, that's, that's a neutral, carbon neutral thing, but we're pulling up this energy out of the ground. And, and what we're finding is it's getting it's much harder to get to. And so therefore, the, you were talking about, I think it was the, the, the ratio of 10. I mean, when they started, when, when you originally started pulling oil out of the ground, the great discoveries of the 20s and 30s in Louisiana and Texas, that was a ratio of 1 in 100. Uh, and what's happened is, is that we've had to go dig, dig. That was, when they did, for example, they did one of the fields uh, in East Texas, they went this unbelievable distance of 3,000 feet below the ground. Because up until that point, everybody was doing, you know, 100 or 2 or 300. If you ever watched what was the movie, um, There Will Be Blood, right? These guys were hand digging these wells. And when you went to 3,000 feet, nobody thought there was oil at that level. And, of course, the guy that proved it was became insanely wealthy. Um, but now to get to some of this stuff, we have to go 200 miles out into the Gulf, into five and 6,000 feet of water, and then drill an additional 35,000 feet. So when you're standing outside and you see one of those jet planes going over at 35,000 feet, that's how long that oil rig pipe is. 
to get down, get to this stuff. That's very, very expensive to do that. So that's the problem that, that we're running into is that all that really good, sweet crude we're using, we pretty much exhausted. Now we're having to go to these really remote places to get it. And, and that's a limited resource. These are all resources that are not that way. So how do we solve that problem? Well, I'm thinking that we have to solve that problem mainly by just greater diversity. Um, we have to have, you know, I think we have to have more wind, we have to have more solar, we have to look at applications where this makes sense. I don't mean to hog the conversation here. One of the problems an electric car has is it needs to be heated in the winter. Okay. Right? And if you run a radiant heater, suddenly your range in your battery drops. And now instead of getting 90 miles, you're getting 60 miles. Right? How do you solve that problem? Well, Volvo solved the problem because I had a chance to drive one of the, their cars. They solved the problem by putting an ethanol-fired heater in the car. So you can drive around you know, in, in, in the wintertime in a Volvo car that is actually using this renewable source to run the heater to heat the car, and you're not having to use the battery. So there, there's kind of applications like that, and there, obviously there are going to be certain transportation things that battery just never makes sense with an airplane, for example. DOD's project is, is, to, um, you know, is, to, is to figure out how we're going to power our Navy fleet of the future, the aircraft and the aircraft carriers, which is why they're interested in working uh, you know, with, uh, with Jim's group to figure out can we make that cost effective so we don't have to rely on that petroleum coming out of the Middle East, yeah. and that's enough. Yeah, they want the DOD is <laughs> looking to go to at least 50 percent of their fuel comes from renewable sources. Uh, I would I would say though uh, you started with petroleum uh, doesn't have its hiccups. Uh, listening to AAA on the radio this morning, gas prices are down primarily because we haven't had a hurricane come through and wreck the oil rigs in the Gulf. Now uh, also too, if you look at when we have severe winters, uh, that can wreak havoc on on their refining. Uh, terminals as well. So oil is not without its, its mm -hmm. limitations from that standpoint. I, I, I would say we've always believed that it's a combination just like Bill said. It's going to take CNG, it's going to take electrification, it's going to take alternative fuels to in, in, in solar powered cars, it's, it's all of the above. And we welcome all to the party uh, because that's what we want to do as a country is be, to be energy independent. Right? That's what we're driving for. It, but for us to get past the fact that a drought can hit, hit the crop hard, you have to look at, okay, so in 2012, the 2012-2013 crop year, uh, farmers yielded about 123 uh, bushels an acre. Uh, the last time we had a drought that severe, it was about 86 bushels an acre. So you've had Monsanto's, and again, the gene, the gene technology guys have stepped up the game. They make corn more drought resistant. Uh, more bug resistant, and I, we haven't thrown out that, that three-letter ugly word GMO yet, but it's a fact of life. We've had GMO crops for years. Uh, yes, all those hamburgers you eat have been feeding GMO corn to for decades, so, and in, in, in you're all still upright and, and having a healthy life. So you've got to understand the technology in advance. Ethanol get, is where it is today, because when it first started, you maybe got 2.4 maybe 2.3 gallons out of a bushel. We're at 2.8, pushing up to 3. What does that mean? It doesn't mean we're going to use more corn. We're going to be, be able to produce more ethanol or use less corn. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand. And, th and there's a lot of opportunity and jobs around those things. That's one of the things we specialize on is how to be the most efficient producer mm -hmm. and to keep, uh, keep using, use less corn uh, while producing the same amount of ethanol. Now, the question you asked was, um, how does weather impact Right. And I think it's actually an ironic question because, um, in fact, the opposite is much more true, right? How do the fuels, particularly the ones down there in the dark colors at the end, affect <laughs> the weather, right? And not just the weather, but the climate, which is an aggregate of the weather over the years, right? And it's ironic that people are asking questions about how, how the weather affects the fuels because the opposite is happening, too. And the mm -hmm. framing of that question of, oh, well, petroleum is already working fine. It works great mm -hmm. in the winter. Yeah, sort of, except that it's making the winter go away. And it's making summers kill the crop, right? And it's making 26 cities in California who have less than 50 cities of water. Right? Mm -hmm. And we're experiencing the impact of what we've been doing for 100 years. We've had a fantastic um, spoiled upbringing of fossil fuels where we used to have 
30 and 50 and 101 ROI. We just put the straw in the ground and the gusher oil wells blast up 100 feet. It doesn't take anything to get that energy, right? But what it does cost is the climate. You spent, you know, some of your state your savings, your fossil carbon was spent. We're running out of that, right? It gets harder and harder to get that. And what you did is you turned it savings to traps. You put that pollution in the air. That's starting to become more and more of a problem. So I think that we need to look at a little bit broader perspective than, well, what we're doing right now is fine. But that's the fundamental assumption for the question. The question needs to be backed up and looked at in a broader perspective. What we're doing right now is not fine. And we need to make changes as soon as possible. We've got great things going on right now. We've got some things hopefully happening more in the future. And we've got great technologies to look forward to you know, that are, are coming online right now. You can get electric cars that use um, you know, a much more efficient mode of production and transportation of energy. And I think that those are the kind of responses that we need all of these above kind of a solution to what, we're, what we have been doing in the past. And we need to stop doing that. Excellent. Uh, we had a, a question on Twitter about the use of nuclear energy for electric vehicles. Um, and kind of tagging into that, if, if we use uh, coal power plants, for example, to power our electric vehicles, aren't we, by proxy, using coal-powered vehicles? Oh, well, yeah, that was the point of the slide I was showing, is that the, the grid at the moment uh, is roughly, I think we're at about 43 or 44 percent of the grid as a whole in the United States is coal-powered. The rest of it uh, is coming from other sources. Uh, the predominant source would be in the west, would be hydropower. Uh, more in the, uh, the east would be nuclear or uh, natural gas. Um, and when you take and translate that amount of energy, again, the point of the chart was when you take, take that amount of energy and translate that into miles per gallon, we're actually, for example, here in, in, the, in the Nebraska area, we've actually improved because I had one chart from a couple years ago that showed us down in the 30 to 40 mile per gallon range. The new chart shows us in the 40 to 50 mile per gallon range if you're calculating it that way. On the question of nuclear power, I'm, re I'm really ambivalent. I mean, I've had the opportunity to stand on the world's first commercial nuclear reactor. Um, I've actually touched the light bulb that that reactor first powered, right? Um, it, it, in some respects, it's a wonderful, clean, low-carbon technology if you don't include the amount of carbon that go, you know, was generated by creating the cooling towers and, I mean, all all of that kind of, of infrastructure. So, so, it's, so it's low carbon in that sense, but at the same time it has this pollution problem, is that what do we do? Because at the same time I was able to touch that bulb and stand on that first reactor in Idaho, they took me out and showed me the pool, and there's this pool, and there's these rods in this pool glowing eerily blue, you know. Um, we have that problem that we've not resolved, so we've, we've created this wonderful technology that we haven't figured out completely what to do with yet. Now, if we could figure out a way to run, and I understand, I think, heard recently the Japanese may have developed a way to create a reactor that uses that energy, but, you know, we come back to the, to the Fukushima, right? I mean, I saw a blog posting, somebody was saying, you know, lest we forget, right, this thing's still leaking. We haven't shut that thing off. So, so I'm really... I, I, I'm, I'm torn whether that's a direction that I really want to go. And, and, and I would prefer that, you know, we're getting to the point to where the solar technology is getting to where we may, in fact, not even... I mean, I have a good friend of mine, Jigger Shaw, who founded Sun Edison, which is one of the largest and first solar uh, installers, you know, in the world. And, and Jigger has long made the argument that, look, we're right now at the point to where solar energy is actually more cost competitive than is nuclear. Yes, we have to figure out how to store it because obviously the sun doesn't shine every day um, or certainly not at night. How do we do that? And that's, of course, then where maybe electric cars and battery technology come in. So, yes, we're using it. Uh, it it's low carbon in the, in the sense that, you know, it's not spitting anything immediately into the atmosphere, but it's got some, some things that really concern me. Well, I, I would say we, one term, terminology has come up is wind. Uh, we've kind of, I, I don't know much about wind. I don't know, Scott probably has more expertise there, but 
when you look at instead of using nuclear, you could use uh, wind turbine to power. Uh, anyone that's driven 80 to Des Moines, <laughs> you see it. We don't see it here, yep. but uh, you know, and to think about Des Moines is our Iowa's been very proactive, and uh, I think they're either second or third. I think between California, Texas, and Iowa, they're the top three yeah. uh, kilowatt producers yeah. from, a, from a wind basis. Yeah. So I, I think there's an opportunity that if we can get more of our electricity into the grid off of wind, that could help us be more successful. You know, the ironic thing is Nebraska actually has way more wind potential mm -hmm. than, uh, than Iowa and even than Texas. Right? But we don't take advantage of that at all. We're somewhere up in like maybe five, number state number five in wind energy potential. We're way down in the mid 30s in realized potential. So, so let's talk about that. How how much have local governments been in support of your technologies, particularly in Nebraska? Uh, in the case of electric vehicles, almost non-existent. I hate to say. Um, Is there anything being done to change that? There, there, there. To be honest, not that I'm aware of. I mean, what, what we need here, of course, is I think more of a commitment. I mean, try to find a, a place to charge an electric vehicle in, in the state, right? I mean, it's just, you know, apart from the dealerships, there aren't any. Not that you, that people are going to use them, and that's one of the conundrums of, of, of this whole question about how do you charge them. Because what they're finding, for example, in states like Washington, where they have a really good charging infrastructure is that the, is that those are getting used relatively little because most people charge their vehicles at home. It's just much more convenient. You get home, you plug it in, you set a timer, the timer comes on at midnight, remember the chart comes on at midnight, uses that low energy that isn't being used by everybody else, charges the car up, you get up in the morning, you got a full tank of fuel. I, I mean, that's really convenient. But people, the feeling is, is that to get over this sense of range anxiety, right, where you drive the car and will I get home or not? I mean, to be honest, I felt that driving my, pardon me, my minivan, right, the wife's got the hybrid, I get the minivan. Um, yesterday, because I forgot to take my wallet with me and I had to come downtown, and, oh my God, my needle's near empty, you know. So I, you can feel that with a gasoline car, right? So with, a, with, with, with an electric vehicle, it's more pronounced because you've got that shorter range, you don't have that gasoline station on the corner. So we, we really need to have... I think some proactive, there are no incentives in this state. Other states have all kinds of incentives. There's a reason why the state of Georgia has, and particularly Atlanta, has more electric vehicles per capita than almost anywhere else. I interviewed a, three, two attorneys at an office in, in, in uh, Atlanta. Seven of the attorneys, or is it what, nine? It was either seven or nine of the attorneys in that office drive Nissan Leafs. Why is it? Well, because the state has passed these very generous, right, incentives. There are no incentives in them, which is the same reason why we have no wind turbines. There are little or no incentives here. So if we want to sort of come up to speed with what's happening in the rest of the nation, we really need to seriously look at how we're allocating, you know, those funds. And what about the other two? There's, there's not much in the way of for ethanol uh, where it stands today. Initially, when plants were being built, there were some tax breaks and credits that were, were, were put into play, but pretty much all of those have gone away. Uh, at a federal level, there was the, uh, the tax credit. Uh, that was actually a credit to Big Oil for buying ethanol. They got a break in their uh, federal excise tax. Those payments never came to an ethanol producer. The only thing that's out there today, uh, really on a national scale, is the mandate. Uh, big oil is mandated to put ethanol in, and that is to break up a 100-plus-year-old monopoly that they've had on the gas tank. Uh, Iowa, though, has, not to drag them in, in here uh, a contrast too much, but Iowa actually is offering their retailers a tax credit for higher blends as an E15, 15% ethanol. So for every gallon they sell, uh, they can get a three to five cent tax credit back from the state. Iowa gets that. It's the largest ethanol producer, largest corn grower. So it understands the promoting of ethanol to try to drive more of that consumption inside the state itself. So Nebraska hasn't done anything particularly at the state level to be really encouraging of biodiesel or any other advanced biofuel. There are other examples nearby, though. Minnesota has actually done a blend lobby. About six years ago, maybe now, mm -hmm. they blend biodiesel into the 
which which applies statewide. It's even B2 or B5, 5% biodiesel in the diesel. And I don't even think at this point that it's even marked on pumps. It's just in there, and that's 5% of your fuel is just a biofuel, and it's not an option or a choice or anything. That's just all diesel fuel is 5% biodiesel now. And Minnesota's colder than Nebraska. Right, so they've so conquered that the major, gelling yeah. problem. Yeah. Well, the gelling problem, like I said, the number one answer to the gelling problem is blend down. And you blend down to like E10. So if you're doing something like a 2 or a 5%, you really don't have that problem. And so that's a state right nearby that has a model that has worked for years. It could be relatively readily addressed by the Nebraska legislature. And it's something that I think hopefully some people will bring forward, something we might be interested in talking to at the Resource Committee and some of our legislators about looking at find out how can we encourage and support biofuels in the state because it's something that can be produced here, create jobs just like corn ethanol does, right? It can create jobs in our state and even in our city, right? And it can help address some of the problems that we have, really broad scale, far reaching problems like climate change and the more narrow and specific problems like Omaha's impending problem with non-attainment in EPA air pollution, right? Two major air pollutants that Omaha is going to be non-attainment for specifically ground level ozone, comes from volatile organic compounds and um, petroleum fuels, right? And so to get away from that will help to start to bend down that curve of an air pollution issue that is impending in our city. And um, biodiesel helps to address that. So I think that hopefully as we start to come into that area where we'll be in non-attainment in a year, I think about a year we'll be in non-attainment in GLO for EPA. And we'll have to do something about it. And either we'll face punishments or being too polluted, or we'll start doing something to address that pollution at the source. And hopefully, you know, the smart decision of, you know, taking away the source of pollution rather than trying to just continue emitting the pollution and then pay the cost of having to try and remediate or the punishment of being too polluted of the city for people to live safely and healthily. I'll, I'll plug ethanol. Let's, let's use E15 in Omaha. Omaha will be the example. Change the fleet to Omaha cars only for this be more of a promotion for it. I mean, there's a lot of things that can be done. Get continue down the CNG pathway with more fleet cars that way. Use more electric. It's 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 coming, uh, and and there there it needs to be addressed now. I think Omaha needs to step up. And so there's some low hanging fruit out there that we right. can utilize quickly. There's things they can there's do today. Models but, nearby that we could follow. Right. You know, the one thing I would say is like, well, if you only put two percent biodiesel, that's not very much at all. That's not going to solve the problem. Yeah, no, but it's two percent of the solution, right? It's two percent better than you were doing, and then you go to five, right? Ten percent ethanol and mid-grade gasoline has solved ten percent of the problem. Mm -hmm. We're ten percent better than we were before we started blending ethanol into the gasoline. If we go to fifteen, we'll be another five percent better. Sure, it's not the whole thing in one shot. There is no silver bullet, right? It's silver buckshot. We need to do a lot of different things all at once to have a comprehensive approach to addressing these complex problems that have evolved through our social and technological evolution over the last hundred years. Speaking of, of buckshot, are there any questions from the audience uh, here at Metro? Yes, please. Yes, there is. And when ethanol... I'm sorry? Um, I would think of it this way. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, can you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the question is, is ethanol contain less energy than petroleum products? And also the follow-up is you need a larger gas tank to, to, go, to go that distance. Uh, the way I would have you think about it is, uh, yes, there is less energy. Uh, a, a gallon, I can't remember, the, it's probably close to 67, 68% of the energy. Uh, but when you look at the discount between ethanol and gasoline at the wholesale basis, Today we're 90 cents a gallon under. Uh, that's a significant drop. So if you if you did it on a cost per mile basis instead of on a an average miles per gallon, ethanol brings you out ahead. And that's why E85 when there is such a spread today, yes, you have to put more. You have to fill up more frequently, but you're saving money by doing that. Uh, I would also say that when you look at it just from an energy perspective you're also excluding what the octane value that ethanol brings. Uh, today, the majority of the, of the base fuel that is, that is used to blend ethanol in is an 84 subgrade octane graded fuel. They get to 87 by adding 10% ethanol. Uh, what big oil won't tell you is they're probably pocketing an extra 15 cents a gallon for doing that. So I hope that answered your question. I would add um, that in the, in the case of biodiesel, um, biodiesel 
petroleum diesel, and actually vegetable oil all have approximately the exact same energy content per gallon. They're not the same molecules. They're a little bit different. But every one of them has the same energy content per gallon. So a gallon of biodiesel added into petroleum diesel has no impact whatsoever on the distance you can travel on the fuel. Okay. Any other? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the question. Right. So what what's being asked is uh, there's a company that has developed a device which reforms formic acid. Formic acid is a very very mild acid. It's used to uh, as a sort of a preservative for corn silage. Uh, it's the primary ingredient in ant venom. Uh, and it's a highly commercial product. Uh, it's, it's, it contains uh, two hydrogen atoms, a, a single oxygen atom, and I think two carbon atoms. And their reformer will allow you to use this formic acid to strip away the, uh, the hydrogen atoms and then feed those into a fuel cell. That gives you then basically a liquid that you can pour into a tank uh, and that gives you essentially the similar range that you would get out of usually filling up with gasoline or something like that. But it is a, a fairly renewable uh, fuel. I don't know a lot about the chemistry of it, but uh, the, at the moment the company, the biggest reformer they build is uh, would power a five kilowatt fuel cell. And to power an automobile, uh, we need something more closer to the range of 100 kilowatts. So they're looking at it more as a range extender to a battery vehicle. Uh, so you'd have a battery vehicle, and then you'd have a small backup range extender, somewhat similar to what the BMW, uh, what's called the REX version, which has the little gasoline engine in it. And then that then runs off the formic acid. It's, it's like a lot of these fuels, there's an issue with distribution. Um, I don't, personally, I have no idea where I would go get formic acid. Sometimes it's even hard finding ethanol, and look how much of an infrastructure we have for ethanol, right? So, so it's it, it's an interesting idea. I think it has potential, but uh, but but it's got some it's got some ways to go before it becomes reality. I'd like to add in that conversation that formic acid is um, not an energy source, right? It's the exact same thing as hydrogen, mm -hmm. or indeed any of these things. Some of these are energy sources, but only because they've been long-term energy storage. Formic acid or hydrogen or a battery is an energy storage mechanism, right? Um, Bill points out he doesn't know where to get formic acid, and he means there's no formic acid station. But in the broader context, there's no formic acid surplus around the surface of the earth where we can just go and put a straw in it. Right. You have to make formic acid with an energy source. And whether that energy source be solar or wind or maybe hydro or nuclear or coal, right, that is still going to be just an energy storage mechanism. So instead of lead acid or lithium ion, you just have formic acid as your energy storage. I just wanted to make sure everybody knows that because a lot of times when people talk about advanced fuels like hydrogen, they seem to have the concept that hydrogen is the energy source. It's only just the battery. It's just the battery is the liquid or the gas. And we come right back. Really, it all, it's all solar in one way or another, <laughs> whether, it was, whether it was a palm tree 185 million years ago uh, or whether it's the, the photons falling on a solar panel on you know on your panels on your roof. I mean, we we really ultimately come back to that, which is why I, you know, showed that I think in the future that's what we're really going to be using as the power. So I heard one interesting statistic, and I've never been able to verify, but it's intriguing that a gallon of gasoline. Somebody said, well, it only takes me a couple of minutes to fill my car. It's a gallon of gasoline. It took supposedly the equivalent of 30,000 years to create that one gallon of gasoline. Mm. And how much do we go through? I just filled up the van to get up here, right? Mm. And I went through 20 gallons, or no, 14 gallons or whatever it was. So think about 14 times 30. Yeah. 420,000 years. 420,000 right years yeah. for me to come up here. Yeah. That's a long time to charge a vehicle. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How many gallons of gas are you worth, right? Uh, well, thank you very much. That's all the time we have today. I want to thank our panelists uh, for coming out today, your time, your, your expertise. Uh, we can actually continue the conversation uh, after the presentation, so uh, I think our panelists will stick around for a few minutes to answer any questions we have from the, from the audience here today. But 
I want to thank Central Community College for, for participating in this event and our staff here at Metro for putting this on. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Good job, well done.